welcome everybody to the third session of the autumn series and as you, as you know we're dedicating this series to quantum biology and what effect it may or may not have on uh, space health uh, we started with the first uh, the first uh, of the session the first sessions was with tom marshburn who talk talked about his life as an astronaut and then scott smith from the johnson space center nutritional biochemistry lab spoke about uh, health, health in space. Uh, two weeks ago was was Doug and Ashvin Beheshti spoke about mitochondria in space. And today we're now going to get down to sort of the underlying physical uh, um, phenomena that, uh, that in which we have evolved and which change markedly in space and talking about the electromagnetic and gravitational fields. And today we're going to be starting with microgravity and radiation effects and how that might uh, uh, change in between Earth service, terrestrial medicine, and and uh, space med medicine, of course. So uh, today our speakers are Chris Parada and David Furman. Welcome. We're most grateful for you giving your talks today. Uh, David's going to uh, start first. And to introduce the topic and our speakers, Alistair Nunn, our Director of Science for the Guy Foundation, visiting professor at the University of Westminster, is going to give you a short talk and introduce our speakers. So Alistair, um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask you to share your screen. Um, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, I'll just kind of introduce the subject. And um, this is really, when we look at a spaceship uh, and we want to go much further into space, are we going to need to do, use more heavy shielding because of the radiation? Are we going to need to have uh, artificial gravity? Um, because if we don't have these, are we going to age faster? And this could be a potential problem. Certainly, the idea of accelerated aging has been around for a long time, actually, uh, although there are some studies suggesting it. There are some markers which don't seem to suggest it. But I think certainly from the theories of aging, uh, we know that um, we all have a limited lifespan. And as we get old, we tend to lose our ability to repair, although small amounts of stress at the right time can tend to offset this a bit. And one of the concepts that's been around for a long time is this idea of inflammation, which is as we age, we tend to get slightly more inflamed. And this is linked into immunosenescence. And certainly from many angles is also associated with reduction of mitochondrial function. And we've certainly <laughs> suggested a long time ago now that a modern sedentary lifestyle can actually accelerate your aging phenotype uh, as represented by the metabolic syndrome. Now, clearly one of the important uh, uh, organelles involved in this is are the mitochondria and these certainly seem to be able to sense changes in the environment and with the right kind of stress they seem to upregulate pathways which improve antioxidant mechanisms uh, enhance autophagy prove repair and regeneration end up with more robust mitochondria and certainly help to, to maintain atp ROS, which seems to be actually essential for the survival and certainly for complex animals, that move, and that includes us, of course, we know that um, exercise and increased gravity can certainly seem to in in invoke adaptation. Some types of radiation, certainly at low doses, but certainly things like temperature changes, oxygen levels, changes even in circadian rhythms. If we go without food, we certainly seem to come a bit more robust and either loss of water, dehydration, even in changes in sleep patterns can all induce some adap adaptation, including some compounds in plant polyphenols, including plant polyphenols that we've seen before. Um, and of course, with this idea, we, we've come to say, well, is the mitochondria good canary to tell us what's going on? And so the question kind of becomes, does going to space put us outside of a our own flight envelope or our metabolic flight envelope? And this is something I've shown before. We've evolved in a certain like uh, Goldilocks zone. And certainly from when we've looked at this uh, from our group up in, in Westminster, the Research Institute of Optimal Health, we, we, the kind of data does suggest if we would live to live a perfect lifestyle, we could live probably towards being 100. But the important thing is um, we would age uh, very well and only get ill very at the end, very much at the end, towards the end of the last two or three years of our life. And this is called mor morbidity compre compression. But what we actually see in a general population is that uh, life expectancy is somewhere between 80 to 85. And we see a period of a reduced uh, uh, health for a slightly longer period, but certainly when we get things like the metabolic syndrome, which of course are associated with obesity, diabetes, we see a, a, a further shortened lifespan and an increased time when we have morbidity expansion. And this includes uh, in, increased uh, propensity for all sorts of diseases, including things like cancer and Alzheimer's. Um, so what's going on in space? Well, 
certainly from some previous lectures, um, it seems to becoming clear that mitochondria do become dysfunctional. And what are the kind of stresses that could be involving this? And does it lead to inflammation? Um, and then one of the clues here, I think, is that certainly when we're in space, exercise seems to be a really good way of offsetting some of the problems. And we certainly know that it stimulates mit mitochondrial function. And due to a generalized release of sort of thousands of probably myokines, it, it induces adaptation right through the body. And it's kind of seen as a you know, panacea, uh, as, a, as a universal medicine in a way. And it's certainly anti-inflammatory. And so overall, masses of data does indicate that the right kind of mitochondrial stress, and I mean by natural, does seem to improve uh, our function. So when we go into space, where do we sit on this adaptive curve? Well, this is a standard kind of biphasic hormetic curve, and it could be argued, and certainly data seems to suggest, if we increase gravity to go to hypergravity, there is an adaptation. Our systems can adapt and become a bit stronger, our, everything gets a bit tougher, and this could be quite beneficial. But what happens when we go into space? Well, we take away all of that. And does this mean that the curve down and left shifts? So we end up with a kind of stress which the system can't ad uh, adapt to. And is this increasing the damage we see? When it comes to radiation, certainly I think this is a bit clearer uh, in the sense that, of course, we know that too much is certainly very dangerous. Uh, and this is obviously exposed. But we do know that very low levels, and this is the work of Ed Calabrese and many others have shown is that very low levels of uh, radiation can induce a, a small adaptive response, which is actually protect, uh, potentially protective and, in fact, anti-inflammatory. But, of course, what happens when we go into space and we don't exercise and we overlay these two curves? This is something which I think we still need to investigate. Um, so it suggests it's the wrong kind of stress. And, you know, or is there a wrong kind of stress or can life always adapt? And certainly... If we look at the big picture and I talk about life in general on Earth, we seem to be able to see that if there's a big event which um, causes a lot of damage, uh, life seems to get simpler but can survive and it seems to evolve very quickly because it has a very short turnover. Um, and we suggested that this could actually suggest what inflammation actually is, which is a kind of uh, a response to try and adapt and restructure. And without it, uh, if it doesn't work, we need to start inducing adaptation. I won't go into this now because it's uh, been running out of time. But clearly, one of the things that does seem to come out of this is, of course, through evolution, we've got uh, more and more complicated and a very complex organisms, although they can adapt very well to uh, uh, stressful conditions because they've got a lot of memory that contain a lot of information. When we get a very big event, there seems to be a down regulating back to much simpler structures. Um, anyway, just to bring us to kind of conclusion here. Um, I think the radiation one is, is, is potentially, I think, quite easy to explain. But I think the more difficult one here is, is certainly what happens with the lack of gravity. And this is going back to something we showed before. We know that mitochondria, for instance, are very tightly integrated with the cytoskeleton and, and the filament system. And certainly through evolution, we've always been used to being having slightly increased stresses. For instance, we run around, we jump up and down, we carry things. And that seems to induce an adaptation to make us stronger. But what possibly has very rarely ever happened is it's been in a situation where we have a very novel stress, which is no gravity. And it, and this could result in inflammation potentially, which seems to exalt, result in accelerated aging phenotype. And this is simply, you know, ancient man. You know, if we did, the only times we probably ever exposed to reduced gravity is we fell off a cliff. Um, and of course, that tended to be fairly terminal. Anyway, with those thoughts in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Furman of the Buck Institute for Aging and Research. Um, this is, seems to be the, the world's first biomedical research institute solely focused, focused on aging. And uh, I think David's going to talk about big data and the AI approach to immune systems during aging and helping everybody live long and better. Um, straight after David, uh, Chris will go on and he's coming from the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine uh, in North Carolina. And he's going to be discussing transgene therapy, uh, well, trans, possibly transgene therapy, but the effects of certainly of solar particle events and cal um, uh, galactic cosmic radiation as well like microgravity on the hemopoietic immune system which of course links very neatly into the inflammation order in the role of inflammation and aging uh over to you david good morning and good afternoon good evening everybody um i am uh, david Furman. i work at the buck institute for research on aging um also at stanford university leading the stanford 1000 immunomes project for now 15 years 
And about three years ago, we started uh, looking at the effects of uh, space and have been working um, very closely with uh, Chris Mason and Afshin Bishati here in the audience as well um, to use uh, the effects of microgravity and uh, spaceflight to model uh, immunological aging, generally speaking, um, and, and diseases. So these are my disclosures. I'm gonna go really quickly because I have a lot of slides I wanna share today with you all. Uh, my focus is in inflammation, generally speaking. 15 years ago, I started realizing that inflammation is important for aging. It's arguably uh, probably the most important feature of aging. It really, there are no canonical markers. And what I'm gonna present in this first part of the discussion is um, very pertinent um, to the second part of the talk that uh, focuses more on the effects of microgravity and simulated microgravity on the ground. But basically, uh, we've been trying to find biomarkers of systemic chronic inflammation, which is very different from acute inflammatory processes. Um, we published a paper uh, this year um, pushing this idea forward that uh, chronic inflammation um, triggers uh, probably all hallmarks of aging. And uh, in this Down for Thousand Immunomes project, we've been focusing on that question. Um, we recruited a thousand people over the years, um, nine to 96 years old of different sexes, um, different um, biological um, features. We found uh, we've been doing multi-omics in this entire population. We raised around $68 million to do the study. And we've been cracking all this data to develop biomarkers of systemic chronic inflammation on the ground. We build this uh, chronic uh, inflammatory uh, clock of aging using deep neural network, which would be, uh, LB, uh, this, this is just the uh, loss function um, I'm going to skip through. Um, but basically what we can do is to predict um, age-related multimorbidity, as you can see from the slide in the middle. Um, we can predict frailty seven years before it happens, so very applicable to things that uh, can happen in space. Um, so this is the predicted frailty score in the y-axis, um, predicted in 2020 and 20, 2010, and the frailty score in 2017. Um, with the same IH metric, we can look uh, at centenarians. They are largely protected from inflammation. Um, there's a lot of variation here, but overall, uh, inflammation seems to be a, a important for longevity. Um, we can also correlate that with left ventricular remodeling of the heart, uh, arterial stiffening, and a number of other things like all-cause mortality in the Framingham Heart Study, when we build uh, an inflammatory clock based on gene expression. Because of a lot of data suggesting that inflammation at baseline perturbs the acute response, we look at uh, immune responses in a thousand people overall, the T cells and B cells are affected negatively. Higher levels of inflammatory age correlate with lower levels of responses and with uh, naive CD8 T cells, which is a hallmark of um, inflammation. We are building um, countermeasures for inflammation um, based on AI and machine learning tools. We run a clinical trial, um, so go from A to Z with the compounds we found. And in the experimental group, we're able to reduce IH significantly in people with high IH at baseline. Um, but definitely there's a need of better tools and better ways to um, discover and develop drugs for aging. Um, this slide probably is very um, uh, known by, by, by most of this audience. 90% of drugs fail. We're in this uh, inflection point where we definitely need to discover new ways. And, and I think one way is to use um, space biology and microgravity conditions on the ground. And I'm going to show you some of that. We even started a company with Chris Mason, my co-founder. It's called Cosmica. And I'm going to show you some of those data. So I don't have to convince you that uh, astronauts are at risk of developing age-related conditions. Uh, the most common being uh, immune uh, decline and um, reactivation of viruses is very common. 
uh, cardiovascular deconditioning, five-fold increase in uh, risk for cardiovascular events later in life, uh, cancer, sarcopenia, and, and a number of other things. These happen at an accelerated rate as compared to what happens um, on the ground. You probably know this paper, the TWINS paper. We see a lot of changes uh, in flight and, and after uh, the, the individuals uh, return to flight. Um, and many of the changes observed in spaceflight resemble what happens in aging, as you uh, can see here, and Alistair uh, was alluding to. Um, not all of them, um, but but many. So um, I'm going to just jump right into the data to share more of the insights that we've been having with, with Chris and Afshin here. Um, so the fact that the entire industry is shifting towards a more private sector taking over um, space really uh, is on the one hand very beneficial because we can have a lot of data from astronauts and it's readily available to us at the moment. Uh, we've been analyzing Inspiration4 data, JAXA6, um, and, and, and uh, now uh, continuing to work with, with Chris to analyze um, the entire Axiom data. Um, so, so it's very um, useful uh, and it's very, um, I guess, insightful uh, to have all these different types of uh, biospecimens run before, during, and after uh, astronauts return uh, to Earth. So many of these time points after return to Earth will basically inform us about rejuvenation in a natural setting, right? So this, there, there's a uh, recovery. It's not like astronauts uh, age 30 years in space and then go back and 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 uh, die, right? They they recover for for some of the features, not all of them though. So we studied cosmic biosciences to leverage space biology and discover new drugs and and um, compounds to counteract the effect of microgravity and also aging on the ground. Um, we're using a uh, rotating wall vessel that uh, was designed by NASA engineers. Uh, the European agency has a different one that preferred by folks there, which is a random position machine. We also acquired that one. We're comparing the two. The one thing that uh, helps a lot with the random position machine is that you you can put a 96 well plate on a 30, uh, 394 well plate to screen high throughput um, for compounds that could reverse those phenotypes. But in this case, we're using uh, four ports, so it's not not a lot of um, throughput. But uh, we're using human organoids as well as blood from 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 uh, patients and from subjects. We expose that blood to 24 hours of microgravity simulation using the uh, rotating wall vessel and do transcriptomics to look for changes at the level of the cells. And so this is one a volcano plot showing that um, things that are largely associated with aging, like MMP9 is one of the markers for inflammatory age that I was alluding to at the beginning of this uh, discussion, CCL2 and a number of other uh, genes that are upregulated during microgravity in peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these individuals overall, and STAT1, things that are part of the immune response are downregulated. So very similar to what we see during aging. RBM3, a very uh, interesting gene that participates in hypoxia. Um, it's downregulated and, and we're very interested to um, drug that one over there. Uh, a lot of changes at the level of monocytes and macrophages, not too much at the level of um, adaptive immune response. So things not, are not exactly aging, uh, but many of the features can be um, uh, indeed recapitulated. Uh, so when we look at the differential responses, so this is an algorithm that basically uh, tracks trajectory of differentiation of uh, cells within the PBMCs. Uh, in the control, you see a normal differentiation. These are um, monocytes right here. Uh, during microgravity, you see this uh, derangement of the differentiation biomarkers in the uh, monocytes, which looks uh, pretty bad um, for, for those type of cells. Uh, you should see something like, like this line turning into the, the red color, whereas in this case, it's not even taking um, a, a, a path uh, outside of this uh, cluster here. Um, in terms of the inflammatory clock of aging that I mentioned at the beginning, 
is increased by about 40% in microgravity. We see features of cellular senescence um, also in uh, the peripheral abdominal nuclear cells exposed to microgravity simulation. We see reactivation of viruses even in vitro only 24 hours after simulated microgravity. This is gamma retroviruses and total viruses. Um, and uh, interestingly, we see um, a, a very dysfunctional ligon receptor interaction in microgravity. So all these three plots represent what's different in simulated microgravity compared to the 1G control. And uh, looking at T cells and B cells as receiver and sender uh, re um, respectively, and then T cells and dendritic cells, T cells and monocytes. So there's a lot going on here at the level of the cell cell communication that gets um, very dysfunctional. We're able to validate these signatures in the Inspiration 4 um, um, uh, uh, space flight uh, mission. Most of the pathways that are upregulated in our system are also upregulated in astronauts. And same for the downregulated ones. There are some that are not exactly uh, following the same direction, but for the most part, the enrichment uh, here is uh, extremely significant. Alistair alluded to um, derangement and, and, and changes at the level of the um, cytoskeleton. That's exactly what we see. This is a, 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 this is a microscopy. And, and what you can see is that uh, under microgravity conditions, there is a um, cytoskeletal uh, remodeling that we believe is causing the uh, dysfunctional mitochondria. So that's probably way upstream of what's going on at the level of um, uh, reactive oxygen species production and inflammaging overall. We were able to validate these findings in vitro by staining with uh, CDC42, which is a GTPAs that regulates um, the integrity of the cytoskeleton is in elevated in microgravity. And we also were able to uh, validate the findings that um, the uh, system uh, recapitulates immune decline by looking at uh, alpha interferon production um, in vitro and under the uh, microgravity conditions. So um, Kim in my group uh, is a, a person that, that does a lot of uh, drug repurposing. He's an expert in that part there. And we've been looking at uh, drugs just very similar to what I sh showed at the beginning, uh, countermeasures for um, inflammaging on the ground. In this case, we're repurposing compounds that can uh, target the genes that are either up or down regulated during microgravity simulation. We selected quercetin, which is something that we really like. It's a senolytic. My whole institute is focusing on, on senolytic and cell senescence. And we're able to uh, completely or almost completely reverse the signatures that we see during microgravity. So this is microgravity versus 1G in the x-axis uh, for up and down regulated genes. And you see uh, the same type of uh, uh, plot, but in this case, under the condition of quercetin, um, which is a senolytic. And, and, and this is more uh, clear in this plot here in the um, heat map showing that the down regulated genes now are reversed and the up regulated genes can be um, uh, suppressed under the uh, treatment with quercetin. Uh, even the same mayo, the, the cellular senescence features that I showed you are um, reversing as well as the IH and the production of uh, reactive oxygen species under conditions of simulated microgravity. Um, so we not only do, um, okay, not only, I see, I see some uh, questions in the chat box, we'll, we'll address those later. So we not only do a PBMC, but also human organoids, right? So in this case, uh, we, we are taking tonsils from um, humans. These are primary organoids. Um, that we embed in a matrix gel and to make it consistent and because otherwise they will fall apart and then subject those to microgravity. And we do a functional assays. Uh, in this case, we're tossing a flu vaccine. They produce flu anti uh, vaccine antibodies. Uh, for the cardiac organoids, we do recording of the heartbeats. 
as well as transcriptomics. And for the neural organoids, we can uh, record um, uh, uh, electrical activity. So this is electrophysiology by looking at the axiom system. Uh, when it comes to the functional assays, you see a massive reduction in the heartbeat uh, of these uh, little um, organoids post microgravity condition. And we believe that's largely caused by endothelial cells um, that are added to the cultures. We also um, build clocks really for a living. Um, so in this case, we're using a transcriptomic clock of the heart based on 400 samples of human hearts that um, that have the age and we can build that clock based on transcriptomics. Under microgravity, we see an acceleration of the clock by five years. So the very massive acceleration of that clock. And in the same type of uh, spirit, we look at disease mapping. Okay, so in this case, we're comparing a laminae mutation, which causes progeria and cardiomyopathy uh, versus our own experiment. And so if you see warm colors in the upper right, that means in both experiments, there's down regulation of genes. If you see, uh, see both uh, a color, um, a red, red and, and, and warm colors in the lower left, that means that there's up regulation in both experiments. And that's exactly what we see. So we're mimicking in this case, uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, in particular, dilated cardiomyopathy that happens with aging when we um, uh, run an enrichment analysis for omim phenotypes. And similar to what we've done before, we can discover drugs that have the effect of either uh, increasing or reversing uh, those um, uh, microgravity signatures, and we're testing those as I speak. Um, these are the... Um, cerebral organoids that we're using to address um, different diseases associated with older age in the brain. Um, we use mostly mature organoids because in the organoid space, uh, they, they're largely um, utilized to simulate or to understand development. So we want them to be very mature. Um, so we use between four and six months organoids and um, uh, Selvi in my group uh, was able to uh, take these organoids, a lot of uh, troubleshooting um, to uh, overall try to see um, neural activity, but also do sequencing. So these are the results of the sequencing experiment. The effect of microgravity is massive. Uh, you can perfectly separate 1G from microgravity and the genes that are up and down, some of them resemble aging, not all of them, but the one um, interesting modification we uh, constantly see, no matter, <clears throat> regardless of the biospecimen, is the uh, cytoskeleton derangement that uh, I, I talked before. Um, as I mentioned before, a few uh, pathways resemble aging in these neural organoids. Uh, in particular, the protein folding related proteins. Um, and we, when we uh, build, a, a, again, a clock for the brain, this is using animal models. Um, in the training a test set, we're doing quite well at predicting the age of a mice. Uh, mice flown in space show 32% acceleration of this transcriptomic age in the brain. This is specific for the brain. Um, I think with that, I should be... Uh, good on time. Am I? I would just uh, uh, want to, you know, thank a lot of people in my group and many others across the U.S. who have helped uh, with many of these studies. Uh, we're also having a collaboration with uh, folks in in um, in Toulouse, in the University of Toulouse in France, where the Airbus uh, company is um, located, and um, and then. Um, you know, a lot of uh, different people in my group have helped uh, put together all this uh, data. We, you know, we do other things than than science. We have fun. They go to the Giants. They so have surfing here in the Bay Area. They they party, and we go dinner quite often to this uh, beautiful Brazilian steakhouse uh, here in San Francisco. So Espetos, if you're around, highly recommended. Thank you so much. Good morning, um, afternoon, or evening.
Uh, it's truly an honor to have the opportunity to share with this group some of the work that Grasa and I have been performing over the past uh, 20 or so years, uh, investigating the impact that two different key spaceflight stressors, um, space radiation and microgravity, have on the human hematopoietic and immune system. So uh, looking uh, at these two stressors individually, um, the one that's been identified as kind of the largest hurdle to uh, long duration manned missions in deep space is uh, space radiation. And uh, despite decades of research, um, radiation induced cancer risk is still the top uh, priority or it's been identified as the top red risk uh, by NASA. So space radiation, um, just as a little bit of background, is different than uh, terrestrial um, photon radiation. Uh, it's comprised of solar energetic particles, or SEP, which are high en highly energetic particles, mostly protons, um, that are released from the sun. Um, and the important thing to remember is that these are intermittent and they're unidirectional. Uh, galactic cosmic rays are actually the bigger problem. These are mainly high energy protons, but they also contain uh, various high atomic number and energy, or HCE particles, um, which are atomic nuclei, so atoms that have been stripped of their electron shell. Um, and GCR originates outside the solar system. Uh, it's thought to likely be from supernovae and active galactic nuclei. And the important thing that contrasts this with uh, the SCPs is that GCR is continuous and it's omnidirectional. So it poses uh, a much bigger problem both from the standpoint of astronaut safety and also from the standpoint of trying to develop shielding. Um, you may wonder why if we've spent decades researching uh, space radiation and looking at the cancer risk, why we don't really know a lot about the effects of SCP and GCR on the human system. And the reason for this is that uh, happily for us that live on Earth, um, SCP and GCR radiation are both almost totally deflected um, by the atmosphere and largely by the magnetosphere um, that surrounds the Earth and acts as a shield. Um, and one thing I wondered was, well, what about astronauts that are on the International Space Station? Um, so the ISS orbits the Earth at an altitude of about 250 miles, um, which is well beyond the vast majority of the atmosphere, but interestingly, the uh, magnetosphere extends out to about 40,000 miles above the surface of the planet. So astronauts that are on the ISS are um, well within the magnetosphere and largely protected from the vast majority of radiation. Um, well, the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, so they were clearly more than 40,000 miles away and must have gone outside the magnetosphere. Um, but interestingly, it turns out the moon spends about six days each month inside the Earth's magnetic tail or magneto tail. And NASA engineers, even in the 60s, realized this and planned the Apollo missions to coincide with the time of the month when the moon would fall within the Earth's magneto tail. So it turns out even the Apollo astronauts, while they were on the surface of the moon, were largely shielded from the majority of GCR. Um, so our lab has um, chosen to focus primarily on the effects of SCP and GCR radiation on the human hematopoietic system. And the reason we picked the hematopoietic system is that it's extremely radio sensitive. Uh, importantly, damage to the hematopoietic system could be life-threatening in a very short period of time, um, since we need roughly five to six billion new cells every single day to be uh, produced to replace the ones that are dying. Uh, importantly, leukemias are one of the most important radiogenic cancers. Uh, and looking from the standpoint of um, mission success, leukemias have a short enough latency that they could arise and progress uh, sufficiently to compromise a Mars mission, for example, that NASA estimates will take about three years. Um, so looking at the hematopoietic system, we have a lot of different um, cell types to consider. We chose to focus uh, up on the top here in this green box at long-term and short-term engrafting hematopoietic stem cells, or HSC. And our reasoning was that um, these are the cells that are uh, responsible for differentiating into and giving rise to all of the mature cells that are present within the blood at any time. Uh, so if something were to happen to these cells, it would uh, impact all of the lineages that are downstream of that. And the first set of studies that we did to start looking at uh, what effects SCP and GCR radiation uh, would have on human HSC um, was to collect bone marrow uh, from healthy adults of typical astronaut age, so between the ages of about 30 and 55. Um, we isolated hematopoietic stem cells using marker CD34, and we brought these cells to uh, NASA Space Radiation Lab, or NSRL, and irradiated them with uh, nothing to have a sham control. Um, we irradiated with uh, gamma radiation as a uh, terrestrial reference. Um, we used protons uh, to mimic SEP. We used iron ions to uh, mimic GCR radiation. And then we also included a group in which we exposed them sequentially to protons followed by iron ions. Uh, 
And this was based on some uh, data from quite a few years ago by Betsy Sutherland showing that uh, in human fibroblasts, at least, uh, you have far more DNA damage if you expose the fibroblasts to protons and follow that with iron. Interestingly, from a radiobiological standpoint, if you expose them to the same ions but in reverse, so ion first and then protons, you don't see any of this synergistic effect. Uh, once we had these cells, we then flew them back to um, Wake Forest and subjected them to uh, a battery of different analyses in vitro and in vivo to try to determine what impact um, this radiation had on human hematopoiesis. So probably the most informative assay was using an in vivo xenograft system. So we took the human uh, hematopoietic stem cells that had been exposed at NSRL to the different radiation types. When we got back to uh, Wake Forest, we transplanted these into immunodeficient mice um, allowed them to engraft for five to six months. Um, so we get between uh, 20 and about 45% human hematopoiesis in these mice. Um, after about five to six months, we then looked at the presence and the levels of human cell engraftment, and uh, we analyzed um, differentiation and lineage commitment to see whether there may be skewing or alterations as a result of exposure to radiation. Um, the first thing that we saw was there was indeed a skewing of lineage differentiation in the human HSC um, in vivo within these mice uh, when they had been exposed to SCP or GCR radiation. So um, what we saw most markedly was an expansion of the lymphoid uh, compartment, um, particularly the T cells. Um, and this was seen um, with protons and with iron uh, and not as much uh, when we had the mixed or the sequential proton and iron irradiation. Um, the most remarkable finding was that in mice that had been repopulated with HSC exposed to uh, GCR ions, so iron ions in this case, um, we found that uh, many of the mice at the time of euthanasia had just tremendously enlarged spleens or splenomegaly. So the spleens were about 30 times the normal volume. And you can see in the image on the left here, we have uh, the spleen from one of the mice that was repopulated with human cells that had not been irradiated. And on the bottom, we have the spleen taken out of one of these mice repopulated with HSC exposed to iron ions. Um, and this was a consistent result that we got with HSC from multiple different human donors. Um, the first question we had to ask, because uh, mice a lot of times exhibit splenomegaly in response to all kinds of things that may have nothing to do with the human cells or with the radiation, um, was whether the spleen was enlarged due to the presence of human cells. So we did flow cytometry here with an antibody to CD59 to detect the human cells. And you can see on the left here we have um, a mouse splenocytes uh, stained with the same antibody in a mouse that was not transplanted with the human cells. And on the right, we can see in the mouse that was repopulated with HSC exposed to iron ions that uh, the entire spleen is just chock full of human cells. Uh, working in collaboration with the clinical um, hematopathologists at the Wake Baptist Medical Center, um, we went through and uh, phenotyped uh, the human cells that were present within the spleen and confirmed that the uh, human HSC that were exposed to iron ions um, developed T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or T-ALL, um, upon repopulation of these mice. And to our knowledge, this is the first and only human cancer that's been reported as a result of GCR radiation exposure. And I should point out that the dose of radiation that we used um, was calculated by our uh, radiobiology collaborator, Paul Wilson, to mimic uh, the dose that astronauts would receive of iron ions during a three-year mission to Mars. Uh, we did whole exome sequencing on the hematopoietic stem cells um, after exposure to SCP and GCR radiation, and you can see the Venn diagrams here on the left showing donor one and donor two, that we have a very similar pattern between the two donors. Uh, and the interesting thing, when we went back to look to see uh, which genes actually contained SNPs or mutations as, or SNVs as a result of exposure to these radiation types, we found there were um, a fair number of mutations that were common to all of the radiation schemes. Uh, but the most interesting thing, and something we're still not sure for uh, what an explanation would be for this, is that uh, when the cells were exposed to SEP or to GCR ions, it seemed that we had a much higher incidence of mutations in genes that have been linked to either hematopoiesis or leukemia. Um, so we put, published these findings a couple years ago in uh, leukemia, and we also did uh, studies that I don't have time to talk about today where um, in addition to looking at direct effects of radiation on the hematopoietic stem cells, we also reasoned that there may be the possibility for biological bystander effects, that if the bone marrow microenvironment were exposed to space radiation and damaged, 
since that plays a critical role in supporting normal hematopoiesis. It may be possible human hematopoiesis would be altered as a result of damage to the microenvironment. Um, and indeed, we found that was the case. So while these findings were troubling, uh, one question that arose um, when we tried to publish the studies and also uh, each time we would present this at meetings was, well, you took the hematopoietic stem cells, um, you shipped them by FedEx to Brookhaven National Lab, you exposed them to radiation there in vitro in a tube, brought them back to Wake Forest, and then you used them to repopulate the mice. Is it possible that some of these abnormalities that you saw are simply because you had the hematopoietic stem cells out of the body for 72 hours or so and were flying them back and forth and manipulating them? what would be a much better thing would be is if we could expose the human hematopoietic stem cells to space radiation while they were inside the body. Um, so to do this, we um, developed what we called um, mouse avatars of human hematopoiesis, in which we followed a similar scheme but uh, changed the order. So here we have the immunodeficient mice. Um, we conditioned them with a very low dose of busulfan um, to free some space in the bone marrow and kind of knock down their endogenous hematopoiesis for a few days. We then repopulated their hematopoietic system, uh, again with bone marrow-derived hematopoietic stem cells from human donors of typical astronaut age, waited until they had stably engrafted, and then brought these humanized mice um, to the NASA Space Radiation Lab and exposed them with whole body radiation to uh, various types um, and doses of radiation. Um, so just looking uh, before we brought them um, to Brookhaven, we went through and made sure that we had multi-lineage human engraftment in all of these mice. And so over the course of uh, more than seven years, um, going back and forth to NSRL, we exposed over 500 humanized mice um, that had been humanized with HSC from nine different human donors uh, to various different um, ions and doses, as you can see here on the right-hand side of SEP and GCR. Uh, and most excitingly, and perhaps most relevant to space flight, um, we were able to take advantage of the, uh, I think maybe now it's only been in existence for about two years, um, the five ion simplified GCR simulator that the uh, physicists at NSRL developed, which simulates uh, the five most common ions uh, present in GCR and enables you to expose all of those in roughly the right dose and ratio for what would be ex uh, experienced in deep space. So uh, looking at long-term human engraftment, um, all of the different groups of mice engrafted uh, one thing we noticed um, at the time of euthanasia was that the human chimerism in blood, bone marrow, and spleen appeared to be a bit higher uh, in the mice that had been exposed to heavier ions. So um, oxygen, silicon, iron, or uh, the GCR simulator in some cases, suggesting we may again have had an expansion of the human cells uh, as a result of these high LAT radiations. Um, once again, we found that mice now that received whole body radiation uh, with HCE ions, again, had uh, tremendous splenomegaly. So you can see um, here at the time of uh, euthanasia, you can see the liver. And then in this green circle, you can see the spleen. And for those of you that work with a mouse, usually uh, when you do the dissection, you have to kind of dig around to even find the spleen. So here, as soon as we opened the abdominal cavity, the spleen basically was just filling the entire thing. Uh, you can see here we had some of these abnormal nodules within the spleen when we did H&E staining. Uh, and importantly, when we went back and stained with an antibody to KU80, which is a human-specific nuclear marker, we were able to uh, confirm that these abnormal nodules were actually um, comprised of human cells. Uh, once again, we saw the splenomegaly um, seem to actually occur as a function of LET here. So we see as we uh, go up in LET, we actually have more cases and more severe cases of splenomegaly. Um, and this is comparing to the sham, we didn't have any splenomegaly. Uh, in the gamma radiation, we had only three cases, and these were very mild cases of splenomegaly. Um, and this is looking at, again, the incidence and the severity in all of the different mice. So each group we had between 12 and 48 mice, um, comparing on the left side to sham, and then comparing to gamma, showing that we had statistically significant differences uh, with each of these different radiation schemes in comparison to either sham or to gamma. Uh, when we went back and did some uh, more in-depth analyses of the spleen by H and E, we can see in one of the mice that was uh, repopulated with human cells and not exposed to radiation, the human cells stained here in brown with the KU80 antibody are fairly evenly distributed throughout the spleen. Um, when we look at the right, we see a very different pattern in the spleen of one of the mice that was exposed to HDE ions. 
So you can see uh, there are a lot more human cells, first of all. And secondly, we saw uh, these pockets of very densely packed human cells within the spleen sections. Um, we went back and wrote uh, an ImageJ script so we could um, precisely quantify this. And when we did that, we found that the mice that had uh, enlarged spleens um, had a significantly higher level of human chimerism within the spleen. Uh, as we saw in our prior studies, when we had irradiated the HSC in vitro and then transplanted them, um, HCE ions again seem to induce an expansion of the lymphoid compartment within the spleen of these mice. Um, and on the left, we can see mice that had splenomegaly and mice that don't have splenomegaly. And in both cases, we saw an expansion of the lymphoid compartment, but that expansion seemed to be much more pronounced in the mice that exhibited splenomegaly. Uh, this expansion of the lymphoid compartment was also evident in the bone marrow. Um, and again, mice exhibiting splenomegaly had a much more pronounced expansion of the lymphoid compartment. Uh, when we went back to try to determine what these lymphoid cells were, we looked at the CD4 to CD8 ratio. Um, and you can see that there's a marked skewing and, in fact, a complete reversal of this ratio in the mice that were exposed to the heavy ions. So rather than having a predominantly CD4 positive phenotype, the T cells within their spleen are shifted and are um, about 75 to 80% CD8 positive. So cytotoxic T cells. Um, and this uh, skewing of the CD4 to CD8 ratio was also evident in the bone marrow. Um, to look at whether there was an alteration in the clonogenic potential of these cells at the time of euthanasia, um, we flushed the bone marrow from the mice and isolated only the human cells using a negative depletion with an antibody to uh, all mouse cell markers and then performed uh, a halo assay, which is a luminescence-based ATP assay um, to examine different lineages and the ability of the HSC to uh, differentiate into each of those um, hematopoietic lineages. And what we saw uh, looking at um, the most primitive colony type, the uh, high proliferative potential colony forming unit, or HPP um, CFC, uh, we saw that some of the heavier ions uh, strangely increased um, the ability of the HSC to give rise to these primitive colonies. And in agreement with what we saw in vivo, uh, there was also a marked expansion of the ability of these cells to uh, differentiate down the T cell lineage. So to summarize or conclude the results of the hematopoietic system, um, our results to date show that human hematopoiesis is markedly altered following uh, direct exposure of the HSC themselves or exposure of the HSC in vivo to Mars, Mars mission equivalent doses of protons or SCP um, and iron ions. Uh, exposure um, to iron ions, again, in vivo appears to induce hematologic malignancy, as was seen when HSC were exposed in vitro and then transplanted. Uh, humanized mice that were exposed to oxygen ions, silicon ions, and uh, the new five-ion simplified GCR simulator also exhibit marked splenomegaly, and they have pathology that's suggestive of some type of hematologic malignancy. Um, and this has now been observed with five different human donors. Um, so at the moment, a licensed uh, clinical um, hemonc pathologist at Wake Baptist is reading all of these spleen slides and immunophenotyping the abnormal human cells to try to diagnose the nature of the human malignancies that are present in the humanized mice that have been exposed to each of these radiation types. Um, at the time that we were looking at the bone marrow microenvironment and changes that were occurring in gene expression, we did um, microarrays. Uh, looking at the different radiation types and which genes were changed and pathway analysis revealed uh, that many of the pathways that were involved could actually be impacted by the compound curcumin. So we thought, well, maybe curcumin would be uh, a very simple to administer countermeasure that would provide some degree of protection. So we did preliminary studies just looking at in vitro colony forming uh, and exposed human hematopoietic stem cells uh, to various radiations and looked at uh, the colony formation without curcumin if we treated about uh, 15 minutes before radiation exposure with curcumin, or if we treated with curcumin 15 minutes after radiation. And you can see we actually had uh, fairly good, certainly good protection against gamma radiation um, and fairly good protection against both protons and iron if we administered the curcumin prior to radiation. Unfortunately, it turns out curcumin is not a great drug because it has very poor water solubility. Um, and as a result, its bioavailability in vivo is very poor. Um, so we began a collaboration with a group at uh, UC Davis and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, who was working on developing um, nanolipoprotein particles, or NLPs, uh, 
Um, and they found that it was possible to package curcumin inside these NLPs and dramatically improve its solubility and its bioavailability. Um, so we performed studies in which uh, we went back to NSRL and irradiated all of the humanized mice, but this time uh, pre-treated the mice by giving an intravenous infusion of these curcumin-loaded NLPs uh, prior to radiation. And you can see that um, administering the CNLPs prior to exposure to radiation, and this was about 24 hours prior to irradiating, um, we had a marked reduction in splenomegaly uh, in response to protons, iron, and the GCR simulator. We also had a reduction but didn't achieve uh, statistical significance um, in response to oxygen ions. Uh, and the CNLPs, when we did immunophenotyping, seemed to provide a little bit of correction as far as the lymphoid expansion uh, within the bone marrow, at least in response to protons and the GCR simulator. Um, but it didn't really seem to make a big difference in the lymphoid expansion that we uh, observed within the spleen or in the bone marrow. Whoa. Sorry about that, my mouse went out of control. Um, so to kind of summarize the findings that we've had on the hematopoietic system with space radiation, um, our findings in vivo uh, mirror the prior findings when the human HSC were irradiated ex vivo, uh, demonstrating a significant increase in the cases of dramatic splenomegaly in mice that were exposed to high LET ions. Um, the spleen and the bone marrow both had significant increases in the lymphoid populations, um, specifically CD3 positive, CD8 positive T cells, um, and this was particularly pronounced in mice exposed to high LET ions. Uh, we saw an increase in um, colony forming potential of both the primitive HPP and T cell progenitor populations uh, when mice were exposed to high LET ions, and the NLPs that were loaded with curcumin um, might be able to reduce the splenomegaly and lymphoid expansion within the bone marrow caused by the high LET ions. I'm sorry, I don't know why my mouse keeps jumping out two slides. Um, so we had quite a bit of discussion about mitochondria, and that's not really an area that our lab focuses on, but I thought it was important to mention this, that there is a group that's um, doing a lot of work looking at the impact that radiation has uh, on the mitochondria. Uh, Tom Hayes' group at Columbia University has actually developed uh, what he calls a microbeam, which enables him to focus radiation on uh, not only the cytoplasm, but on specific regions of the cytoplasm of cells. So he's actually irradiated individual mitochondria and has published uh, several different papers looking at what this does to the mitochondria. And he's shown that a lot of the damage that occurs as a result of exposure to space radiation may not be due to damage directly to the nuclear DNA, but damage to the mitochondrial DNA that is then passed along into the nucleus. Uh, so at the beginning, I mentioned the two stressors we were going to talk about were space radiation and microgravity. So I'm shifting gears now to microgravity. Um, studies for quite a few years have suggested that space flight and particular microgravity um, is able to pronounce marked alterations in the hematopoietic system. So studies have shown uh, alterations in subset distribution of leukocytes, uh, changes in cytokine production, um, reduced T cell activation, uh, decreased resistance to infection, and in particular, uh, as David had mentioned, there's a lot of studies showing reactivation of latent viruses in astronauts. So the questions we wanted to ask are, uh, does microgravity alter the ability of human hematopoietic stem cells to differentiate into functional immune cells and or does it impair their ability to recognize and eliminate tumor cells? And our concern was that astronauts, uh, if this proved to be the case, would be doubly at risk of cancer due to an accumulation of mutations from being exposed to space radiation and then the potential reduction in the ability of the immune system to recognize and eliminate any transformed cells that arose. Um, so the first, uh, the two cell types that we decided to focus on are dendritic cells uh, and natural killer cells. So generating an effective immune response requires antigens to be processed and presented to T cells by antigen presenting cells or APCs, um, the most potent of which is the dendritic cell or the DC. Uh, DCs also function as effector cells in innate immunity. And we reason that because dendritic cells exert an influence over both innate and acquired arms of immunity, any defect in their production or function would result um, in a fairly substantial impairment of immunity. So we evaluated the ability of human HSC to generate uh, dendritic cells under conditions of 1G and micro-G. Um, and we used the, exactly the same system that David showed, the rotating wall vessel developed by NASA um, that's uh, manufactured by a company called Synthicon. 
that basically takes cells and places them in a perpetual state of freefall to model microgravity on Earth. Um, so we isolated CD34 cells, placed them in serum-free media with a cocktail of cytokines designed to um, promote differentiation into dendritic cells. And we did this under normal gravity and then analyzed the cells or uh, in the Synthicon rotating wall vessel to simulate microgravity and then analyze the cells. Um, importantly, we showed that our serum-free culture under normal uh, gravity was able to then uh, generate both plasmacytoid and myeloid dendritic cells. Um, but quite amazingly, when we looked at um, either plasmacytoid or myeloid dendritic cells, um, trying to perform this differentiation under conditions of microgravity markedly impaired the ability of the HSC to give rise to either of these two lineages. Um, and the, particularly the plasmacytoid DC, differentiation under microgravity almost completely precluded the generation of these cells. Um, so our results suggest that microgravity could delay the production of DC and markedly reduce the number of these important antigen-presenting cells. Um, and uh, we published this a couple of years ago. In addition, we did some other studies that I don't have time to go into today, showing that if we took um, human hematopoietic stem cells and exposed them to radiomimetic drugs uh, in either normal gravity or microgravity, um, DNA damage repair was also inhibited uh, in the presence of microgravity. So the other cell type I wanted to focus on are natural killer cells. And the reason uh, for this is that natural killer cells are the body's first line of defense against malignant cells. Uh, so we reasoned that if there was any damage uh, to this particular lineage, it would have a pronounced effect on cancer risk for the astronauts. Uh, so we did this initially um, first using a traditional cytotoxicity assay in which we cultured uh, NK cells taken from uh, normal healthy donors, either uh, in one G, just in a normal flask, or um, in the rotating wall vessel under microgravity for 48 hours, uh, then took these cells um, and put them into a standard cytotoxicity assay, looking at their ability to lyse uh, various different human leukemic cells. Um, and we saw that, indeed, um, culture for 48 hours in microgravity reduced the cytotoxicity of the NK cells against MALT4, which is a human T ALL uh, leukemia. Now, one inherent problem with this assay that we uh, were concerned that we might actually be underestimating the impact of microgravity is that you have to take the NK cells out of microgravity and place them in co-culture for four hours in order to do the cytotoxicity assay. And this occurs under normal gravity. And prior studies have shown that gene expression of hundreds to thousands of genes occurs uh, within only seconds of being exposed to a change in gravity. So we reasoned that we had to develop a better assay in order to go through and um, rigorously address this question. So we came up with a system that enabled us to do a cytotoxicity assay under continuous microgravity. So uh, as a control, since we were now growing everything inside the halves, our 1G control, instead of being a flask, um, became the halves basically tilted horizontally sitting on the base of the system instead of rotating and being in free fall. Uh, and this involved uh, quite a bit of <laughs> engineering here where we had to be pipetting in and out with syringes attached to the different ports to make sure that the volume stayed the same and that we weren't disturbing any of the cultures. And we went through then basically and did exactly the same assay, only taking the supernatants out after all of this co-culture had occurred in microgravity. Uh, and we saw that continu mi continuous microgravity also reduced NK killing um, quite a bit more pronounced than we saw when we had the four-hour uh, co-culture done at normal gravity. So supporting our hypothesis that by taking the cells out of microgravity and doing the traditional assay, we were actually uh, inhibiting or um, minimizing the effects of microgravity. Uh, and this is just showing this here. If we did a statistical analysis, we had um, a significantly greater decrease in cytotoxicity when we did this under uh, continuous microgravity. Um, and this uh, occurred in um, two different uh, primary human donors, uh, in addition to um, an NK cell line that's traditionally used to look at NK cytotoxicity. So our conclusions on the microgravity-induced immune alterations, uh, microgravity impairs the ability of human HSC to differentiate into dendritic cells. Um, and these cells serve as uh, critical sentinels for early detection of cells that have undergone transformation. Um, Micro-G also significantly reduced the anti-leukemic activity of human NK cells, specifically against TALL, 
which was the malignancy we observed uh, following exposure of human HSC to space radiation. Um, these experiments constitute the first demonstration of a cytotoxicity assay conducted under continuous conditions of microgravity. Um, and our results reveal that prior studies using standard cytotoxicity protocols likely underestimated the impact of microgravity. Um, we've also performed RNA-seq on uh, primary human NK cells from three different donors cultured under either normal gravity or microgravity, and we're currently analyzing the data to see if we can determine the mechanism whereby microgravity is impairing the ability of the NK cells to lyse hematologic tumor cells. Um, and these are um, some PCA analyses that we actually just got yesterday, so <laughs> we haven't had a chance to go through and figure out what all the genes are, but we can see that we actually have fairly nice clustering um, from all three donors, uh, the NK cells in 1G compared to microgravity looking at um, both microRNAs and at mRNA transcripts. Uh, and just uh, a couple other quick things I wanted to touch on. So the immune alterations weren't only within the peripheral blood and the spleen. We also did studies in wild-type mice looking at uh, the impact of radiation on the GI tract, since that's also a very radiosensitive uh, tissue. And we saw that uh, space radiation induced marked lymph, uh, leukocyte infiltration and swelling or uh, enlargement of the lymph nodes within the small intestine. Uh, and we also saw alterations within uh, the lymphatic system, so particularly in the lacteals, which are lymphatic capillaries in the small intestine, and we saw evidence for vascular congestion and bleeding. Um, and these studies were just published a couple months ago uh, in Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Sciences. And then just one last image um, that's kind of a teaser, I guess, of another study that we're still trying to write up the results from this. but. Um, uh, Grasa had gotten the grant actually, uh, I think about 15 years ago from NASA to look at the impact that microgravity might have on stem cell differentiation. Uh, and the particular stem cells we were using here were mesenchymal stromal cells or mesenchymal stem cells. And we showed that if we grew those under normal gravity or simulated microgravity, we had marked changes at the proteomic level. And uh, most strikingly, when we would study the um, inherent differentiative potential of these cells by transplanting the human MSC, into fetal sheep at a period of pre-immunity, normally uh, these liver-derived MSC, when they were transplanted, would give rise to large numbers of hepatocytes within the livers of the sheep. And this is what we saw with normal gravity. When we looked at the pancreas in the hopes of trying to find uh, cells that could be used to treat diabetes, we saw that MSC grown under normal gravity didn't really have propensity to engraft or give rise to any cells within the pancreas of the sheep. Um, quite remarkably, when we grew the MSC for only a couple days under simulated microgravity and then transplanted them into fetal sheep, they lost the ability to give rise to hepatocytes, but they gained the ability to engraft within the pancreas and give rise to insulin-producing beta cells. Um, so this is a study that we're still in the process of writing up and trying to determine what the mechanism is for this change. Um, and with that, I would just like to finish by thanking everyone who was involved in these studies, um, particularly Gasa, who's the co-lead on all the studies, um, and all of our collaborators at various different institutions. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of the funding agencies that have supported us for all these years to enable us to do these studies. So, thank you very much. <laughs>